Welcome to another edition of Athletic Director U. I'm Trisha Turley Brandenburg, Deputy Director of Athletics at Towson University. Joining me today are Thor Bjorn, Director of Athletics at the University of Rhode Island, and Tim Hall, Director of Athletics at UMBC. Our topic today is embracing innovation. Thor, can you talk to us a little bit about, um, sometimes college athletics is painfully slow to uh, adopt change. You know, why do you think that is? I think higher education in general can be very slow, uh, especially at state institutions. They can become very bureaucratic. And so I, I, sometimes we're guilty by association with, within that same umbrella. And so it's really in our best interest to always try to be, we always think we're, we're efficient, and we always think we're trying to find the most effective way of doing things. But again, you're caught up in systems. And I, 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 so what we have to try to be is as innovative as we possibly can and be open to new ideas and how to, uh, how to make things a little bit smoother, quicker, and, and really embrace technology. And one of the great things about sort of our industry today and being around a, a place like NACTA is you get to see so many young people coming up in this business and they bring with them incredible ideas uh, and ways of doing things better and more efficiently. So we have to be able to adapt. Okay. Tim, while the nature of higher education institutions is, as um, Thor indicated uh, and many stakeholders lend itself um, sometimes to being agile, sometimes not, one would think that athletic departments being smaller operations you know, than the university at large uh, can be far leaner uh, in some ways. You know, what have you done within your department to try to maximize the speed of decision making? Sure, that's a great question. And you know, to uh, touch on Thor's point, you know, institutions of higher learning really are bureaucratic for, for a lot of different ways. Uh, you know, I've seen in my time as a leader uh, at the institutions that I've served how important it's been to uh, be very relational with the individuals on other other parts of the campus. And I was telling Thor that I, in my time, there's there's been a direct correlation I've seen between the increase in expediency of getting things done, uh, running parallel with that is the increase in diplomacy. And so, you know, again, going back to whether they're state institutions or, or private, we're all challenged resource-wise. It's all relative. And so I think you can become more nimble uh, as an athletic department, whether it's technology or other facets of the department, when you're building relationships with other facets of the institution, bringing them into your program, explaining the why in terms of what you're trying to accomplish. And uh, usually, usually most times those individuals are gonna get on board and help you uh, satisfy the objective that, uh, that you're looking for. So what we've been able to do at UMBC, and we're an institution that is very innovative. We're a STEM school and so technology is talked about all the time. And as we've implemented technology in a very lean department, it's been through the successes that we've had building relationships with academic units and deans and vice presidents for IT and, and student affairs. And I guess on that note, kind of, have you been able to kind of move faster by building those partnerships? And have you partnered on any you know, particular technologies or innovations that you've used in your department? <clears throat> Absolutely. We've, we've uh, been able to do a number of things. I mean, I think first, uh, a, a good example would be you know, when we win the conference tournament in men's basketball, knowing that we had already started to have uh, a significant increase in the traffic to our website. And we have a, a, a special guy that, that does our, uh, our social media stuff. And in between the time that uh, we won the game and they, we, they had the, the announcement of the, the, the tournament teams, uh, there was such a spike that the website crashed for the institution. And they quickly, because of relationships that they had, and I don't understand all the technology specifically, but patched it in a way <clears throat> and increased the bandwidth so that it would be at the same level that they would do if there were some type of natural disaster. And that happened, typically that would be something that would take a week to 10 days, and it happened in probably six or seven hours. And then what was really unique about that was when we're playing the game against Virginia, the website crashed twice when it was set to the highest level, which is kind of a unique story within the, within the story itself. So, uh, you know, being a lean university, we've partnered with our College of Engineering. We've partnered with uh, the, uh, the Office of uh, IT in, in terms of the, the things we're trying to uh, accomplish from a, a technology perspective. And it's the sharing of those resources. And that's probably the biggest thing, Tricia, is, you know, the, 
you know, there's no great mystery to what we're all trying to do from a technological perspective, but what's really helped us is the relationships we've been able to build and the sharing of resources that have allowed us to be more nimble. Great. Um, the digital era, in many ways, has forced athletic departments to move faster, as you've talked about, uh, when it comes to creativity and ideation. Um, what systems have you guys established at Rhode Island uh, with your departments to take, um, you know, and compete with better resource programs? Sure. I, I, you know, again, I want to go back to what Tim was saying, and that's the collaboration on campus. And I think that's what's been, for the flagship university of, of in the state of Rhode Island, you know, we still are resource, we're resource challenged just like so many others. And so the only way we're going to continue to move forward is, is to build collaborative relationships on campus. And we've really, you know, one new primary one that, that we've done uh, this year is working with a company called Viviture as it relates to um, tracking uh, student athlete medical records and, and actually going back and being able to have our training rooms be, uh, get, get, uh, receive uh, finances from insurance companies for treatments that they're providing. And when I first heard about Viviture and, and the technology they bring to the table, it seemed what, like one of those, hmm, not sure I understand what that's all about. But over the past year, it's been incredible, not only because it's a revenue source, which is terrific and we all need it, but even more importantly, it allows us to rather get than have all this paper everywhere to be able to have electronic files that are now also, we're working with our, uh, our compliance software to make them uh, talk to each other and, and utilizing experts to be able to help us do those things. So between things like ARMS on our, our compliance software or Viviture from uh, medical records, it's, it's huge. And it does make me smile to think about what it was like 10 years ago when we didn't do any of this stuff. Yeah. And we have to keep getting better. Obviously, some of the requirements from privacy standpoints, but then also just the, the worlds that we live in where people are looking for information quickly and there's an expectation that we're going to be able to provide it like that. We have to be open to it, and I think it allows us to, to be more efficient and cost-effective. Uh, maybe making some initial investments up front at times, but uh, in the long run, it, it makes us really run a lot smoother. And so that's just the beginning. We have to you know, continue to get better. One of the other things that, that I'll mention, uh, sort of to go along with what Tim was talking about before, which was collaborating on campus, the Atlantic 10 Conference, where we can compete, uh, is really uh, doing, I think, a really great job of going out and doing some brittle, brid, digital broadcast, and, and we're behind the eight. We have not made the investments that we need to make in that area as of yet. We've been very fortunate with some local TV uh, contracts that have helped with that, but now we've got to step up and do it. So, you know, we're going to work with our communication school, who's terrific, and building a sports broadcast um, program that's going to start this fall. So over the next couple of years, we have to be really on the forefront with them, get out of I hope to think that we don't live in silos at Rhode Island. We're certainly trying to not be. Uh, but that's a perfect example of saying, hey, here's experts on campus that know a lot more than anybody in our athletic department does about digital broadcast production. How are we going to take advantage, provide them with a laboratory, and allow us to have state-of-the-art equipment? Awesome. You know, to Thor's point, we in the America East went all in on ESPN3 and now the ESPN Plus model, which required us to go from doing very minimal TV with technology, fast forward very quickly into running a full TV production. And so I was fortunate that we were able to build some relationships when I was in Kansas City with the Niles Media Group folks. And, and because of those relationships, uh, bring the Niles Media Group folks to Baltimore, um, worked very closely with our institutional leadership. And again, it goes back to the, the collaboration and building those relationships to the point where we will next year have almost exclusively a student-led production. And that was partnering with our communications school. They're going to offer a minor uh, ultimately in the program. And as people in the TV world will tell you, they retrain people who are trained formally in school. They retrain them to do the work once they get out. But it's great for them to get that basis of knowledge. And so now we're able to offer young people who come and have an interest in sport to say, you can be some part of something special and learn skills doing linear quality broadcasts and, and having a student-led um, production team that's being supported by the Office of Institutional Advancement, the Office of IT, um, the College of uh, Humanities. It, it, it's pretty special. How has that type of partnership kind of impacted your relationships with the academic side 
of your campus too in terms of supporting what they're doing from a classroom standpoint? It's a great question, Tricia, and it's, and it's, it's been huge. Uh, you know, I think I always tell people, tell me I forget, show me I remember, involve me, I understand. And so when you start to involve those people in the work that you're doing and they see that it, that it is real, that there are definable skills that will translate into the working world, they as academicians can bring that back and they use it as a sales point for enrollment into their college as well. And so we, we really try, at least since I've been at UMBC, to immerse everybody from various factions of the, the campus into the life of our program and what we're doing because, again, as I've said, I think that you know, if you tell somebody, they'll forget. If you show them, they'll remember. But if you involve them in what you're doing, they'll really, try, they'll really understand, and that's going to help you ultimately get to your goal. I think along those lines, I think it's, it's the athletic department's responsibility to be proactive in that way. Uh, so often, I think athletic programs have, have been on that island and, and sort of separated ourselves. And it really is to our best benefit for our students and to the universities that we all work for is to be proactive, go out, build those relationships, and explain to what we're doing. Because as we all know, we have amazing student athletes that, that are part of these campuses. But if we're doing them a disservice, if we're not engaging the faculty and, and engaging programs or other divisions within the university to try to help us and vice versa. So I think it's, it, it really is up to us. And, and only then, you know, as, as Tim was talking about, Will we be able to, I think, really become one unit within the entire university? Goes back to the first question: How do we become more efficient? We get out of our own, you know, we get off the, get off our islands that sometimes we put ourselves on. Absolutely. Um, what about at an individual sport program level? You know, what are some of your coaches doing to innovate within their own teams? We have, I mean, it's, it's funny, there's, there's new things that we hear about all the time, and, and sometimes they're great. I remember a coach coming to me talking about uh, heart rate monitors, and how can you say no to something like that until you talk about afterwards at the end of the season, hey, I want to see some of the data. You know, I, I don't want to necessarily go out and, and drive the data, but I, I love looking at it after the fact. And uh, when a coach comes back and doesn't have any because it seemed like a good idea and didn't work if for, three, for three days, then you kind of say, hmm, you know, maybe we got to think about things differently. So I think our coaches are hearing about great things. There's great technology out there. Our basketballs, for example, are, are really, you know, I think, and that's the programs that we are trying to invest in to compete truly at a national level. And, and, uh, and so we want to keep uh, investing in, in certain areas like what is the top video that we can provide? What are the top uh, uh, health components that we can then track our, our training and, and so forth? So we're learning from that area, really making sure that, that the experts within our department, the, the strength and conditioning folks, the, the trainers that have that great knowledge, and then as we try to enhance our video production and so forth to make sure that we're, we're, we're I think, almost treating each one like its own little lab space and then branching it out based on success. And how do you kind of bridge that gap between kind of the coaches coming and asking for the heart rate monitors, you know, and connecting that with kind of the professionals within our departments with athletic trainers and, and strength it's, and conditioning to, to try to make sure that those things are successful? It's a great question. I, I kind of jumped in, uh, into your question because I, I think one of the areas that when I came to Rhode Island that, that I struggled with the most, and it was more from my, my previous experience, and that was strength and conditioning. And you hear a lot of times as ADs, you know, Head coaches really put a lot of, um, you know, strength and conditioning is huge. I mean, that's based on, on really their ability to be successful, win games, and, and ultimately keep their jobs. I mean, that's, I think, how coaches look at it. And when I got here, I, I was trying to grasp that. How do I, how do I get a handle on that? Because you have strength and conditioning people that maybe have this philosophy. A coach is saying, hey, I want to do this. This is the type of preseason training I want to do. This is the conditioning testing I want to do. And we had, uh, who just retired, we had a gentleman who was our, uh, we had promoted to Associate Athletic Director for Health and Performance, and combining the oversight of training and, and the training room and strength and conditioning. And what he said to me was the most basic thing, show me the science. If you can show me the science, then we'll craft a program around that. But otherwise, coach, we're putting it in the expert, the hands of the experts, the ones that are trained in this area. So if it's a softball uh, conditioning test versus a football test, what's the science behind it? And so that was, it, it's funny because it sounds so simple now, but when I came as my first AD job 11 years ago, I'm thinking, you know, how do we support the head coach so that they're getting what they want from this, the strength coach? No. 
head coach, you tell the strength coach what you ultimately want, they will then build it for you. Absolutely. Is there any other technologies that, that your sports programs are using? That you know, we, uh, we, Thor mentioned a number of them. Obviously, we're with ARMS. We're, we, we hired a new women's soccer coach. She brought from her, from her institution the heart rate monitors. Our men's basketball program wanted to use them. And, you know, how we really try as a, as a resource challenged uh, program, no different than, than many others, you know, we talk about, you know, priorities. And priorities don't mean other things aren't important. Priorities mean what you're going to do first. And so because of the success of men's basketball and now seeing how it's benefiting all of our other programs, I think our people really understand it's important for us to invest in that program first. And so we really try to have a very decentralized approach that's supported centrally. And what I mean by that is, you know, softball's having conversations and uh, baseball and track and field and the lacrosse is because some of their needs are different. But how we support that is essentially, so to Thor's point, if one coach wants something that's an outlier for strength and conditioning or from the training room, we have to look at man person hours in terms of can they really support that? Is it something that's needed for that program? If in fact it is and we can't, well, we'll talk about having somebody maybe from the outside come in and help because we want to put all of our programs in the best possible position to be successful. Uh, sometimes that that means bringing new technologies in from the outside. Sometimes it means thinking about it and reprioritizing a little bit more internally. Great. Um, what about the student athlete experience overall? You know, um, we talked a little bit about the formation of partnerships with campus and the academic side, but what about local community? Um, you know, and is being partnered with a particular academic department, program, or business, um, has that led to any great results for your campuses? You know, at our place, we're a young university, and so it, it's actually a pretty unique um, case study on higher education. You know, our president, Freeman Rabowski, has been at the university, I think, for close to 30 of our 50 plus years of existence. I don't know if you can see any entity, public or private, where a leader has been in, in place that long, and the institution has really been built in, in his image. And uh, because of that, we're an anchor in, in the Baltimore community. and so. Where we weren't that strong was our relationships with the community from an athletic perspective. So I've worked very closely with our Office of Institutional Advancement and our president to go and build those relationships in the community specific to how it could benefit our student athletes. And also the, the, the reciprocal, getting our student athletes out more into the communities that, that where there's mutual service to both. They serve our student athletes, our, service, our student athletes service the community and so I think that the more that we can do that it helps our brand uh, certainly as a young university and from a from an innovation branding perspective one area where I think we we struggle and it's because of our youth, youthfulness as an institution is the notion of influencers and I was talking to somebody the other day about a gentleman who's in the the, the Washington DC area who has become an influencer he's a, a former chef who's in, I think, working in IT now, but he goes to restaurants and writes reviews and has a, has a blog and a website, and people are going to, the, to this guy's website and blog before they determine where they're gonna go eat dinner. And he has become such an influencer in the food scene in DC that it's benefiting those institutions. Well, you know, I've worked at institutions in the past that had former student athletes that were in the pros. Or for example, when I was at Kent State, Michael Keaton, the actor, and Drew Carey, the actor, were uh, former uh, student athletes and were, were involved with the, the institution. We don't have a lot of that at UMBC. So our challenge for our student experience, because so much of what they do is this, <laughs> is finding out who those influencers are and how can we attack that from a social media and branding perspective because that's what young people relate to and it's who is, who is out there that's saying that we're cool and you know, for example, you know, after we you know, won our game against Virginia, one of, our, one of our players when he was being interviewed said, what did that feel like? And he said it was when you, when you felt like you got your first win in Fortnite. Well, right away that got the Fortnite guys you know, as influencers, and then two days later, they were having a conference call with this guy Ninja, and I don't know anything about it, but I mean, that just shows you how important, you know, influencers are from a branding perspective, especially how it relates to young kids. 
Yeah, and obviously, you know, in the tournament, you guys gained a lot of notoriety from social media and, and your social media accounts. Kind of, how have you guys leveraged that, you know, since the tournament um, to maybe try to impact or, or draw in some of those influencers? That's a great question. You know, uh, as, a, as a one-person shop, we're, 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 I think now the difference is we're being more um, proactively strategic. You know, our, our uh, gentleman who does that, Zach Seidel, is fantastic. He's got a great sense of humor. Um, uh, knows technology inside and out. It's something I couldn't do. I mean, I think, I, myself personally, I think people from that generation are more adept at being able to do that with the expediency that, that, that they're able to do it. I mean, I certainly, I, I couldn't do it. And he was doing really great stuff. We just weren't on a national stage yet. But we've gone back and looked at some of the stuff that he'd done prior to that. And, it, and it's pretty unique and, and impressive. And so now we've been looking at, again, going back to saying, you know, we're decentralized in our conversations, but how does it look brand-wise that it's supported centrally? It's okay, well, what can we do from a social media perspective for some of our other sports? Because just because men's basketball has had a tremendous amount of success in a short period of time doesn't mean our other sports aren't important. We want them to be successful. And how we get their messages out, especially from a social media perspective, might be a little bit different. And so when you are resource challenged and you, maybe you don't have the human capital uh, to be able to put um, on the task of growing what your, your brand from a social media perspective. It's, uh, it's really having Zach work with our coaches and having that sense of, of nimbleness and, and having uh, more proactive dialogue about being strategic in terms of goals. I think before we were probably proactively reactive, if that makes sense, but we're a little bit more strategic now in terms of how we're going about our business. I think the resource challenge concept that, that Tim talks about is, again, I can relate to everything he's saying. And one of the things that we've tried to do along those same lines is sort of the everybody's a marketer, everybody's a salesperson mindset. And so trying to utilize, so, I mean, social media brings with it some incredible challenges, as we all know, but it also brings some great opportunities. So if we can get everybody thinking that way and realizing that a lot of people are getting their information about URI athletics in some form, from social media, as long as we can have that, that common message that's out there and then we're tracking it and being aware to make sure the messaging is important is, is, is really critical. And it's a great, it's a great resource. It also can be a challenging resource. Yeah. Any kind of last words of advice for athletic directors or aspiring athletic directors out there about embracing innovation? I think embracing innovation on a college campus is, in, in my mind, is being open to anything that comes your way. Don't be scared of it look for experts, and build relationships on your campus. It's, those are the folks that, that really want to help and, and have the greatest uh, intellectual capital to be able to bring forward and, and help us all get better. Yeah, I would just you know, couple what Thor was saying. I, I tell my folks and those who know me, I always joke and say that I'm an esteemed graduate of the School of the Technologically Declined. <laughs> I graduated first in my class. And so you, know, you always have people around you who are good in the areas where maybe you're not as, as proficient. And so. You know, seeing what we've done from a brand perspective relative to social media has had to get me out of a comfort zone a little bit to embrace it more. Uh, you know, that's something that you know intuitively is not in my wheelhouse. And so, what I would suggest to you know current and future ads is whether it's technology or any other area of your skill set that you might feel that isn't one of your top uh, sets, that, that you know, get out of that comfort zone and. And, and talk to people, talk to colleagues who you see as uh, maybe being better than you in, in that area because ultimately that's going to catch up with you. And, uh, and I think it's important for you to do that. Great. Well, thank you again both for joining us for the latest edition of Athletic Director U. Again, I'd like to thank Thor Bjorn and Tim Hall for joining us today.